welcome. Let's talk about goblins. Goblins. You can't ever get rid of us. We're always going to be here, see? So you might as well make the best of it. It's one of these very general, common, staple fantasy monsters. See them all the time in games, and of course they're a staple D&D monster. Now there's nothing wrong with doing goblins in a standard typical classic way. The characters are traveling down the road, the goblins pop out of their hiding spot and ambush everyone with hopes of robbing, killing, plundering. Goblins are nasty, mischievous, but nasty little buggers. So there's really nothing wrong with that. There's plenty to enjoy with just a standard goblin encounter. Especially if you, and I'm talking about the GM here, really get into the goblin character and do the voices and a bit of mannerisms and give them that extra little punk element. Give them that bit of sadistic glee that can really give personality and energy to the encounter because otherwise the goblin stat block is a fairly simple creature. There's not a lot going on. In my most recent issue of my newsletter, Scrolls of the Bard, I did a bit about goblins, actually a really big bit about goblins, where I created some new types of goblins, like different goblin stat blocks, added a bit of lore and world building as I'm currently building up and recreating my RPG world of Ikoros, and I tied it into this big map, actually the biggest dungeon map that I've ever done in my life. This is all inspired very much by a campaign that I ran for a few years called After the Mists, which this was one of the first big dungeons that the characters went into. They had a bit of a disastrous delve and then they came back later at higher levels and had much greater success. So I drew heavily from the adventures that I ran in that corner of that campaign. So. With the goblins that I recently made, and I'll show those off here in just a moment. The stat blocks are supposed to be interesting, have dynamics, have a bit of depth, build upon the baseline goblin. These goblins can be challenging to low-level characters or mid-level characters. And the stats express those bits of the goblin's personality, their inclinations, their culture, if we can call it that. Aesthetics-wise, I do have preferences with goblins. Um, I really like the way the 3E goblins looked in D&D. The 4th edition ones, meh. The 5th edition ones, I'd say, are kind of in between for me. I like them a little bit better than the 4th editions, but less than the 3E. I greatly dislike the appearance of the Pathfinder goblin. You know, some inspirations of mine would probably first start with Tolkien. So, books like these, which would have both written descriptions and then artistic representations of them. And then the old animated movies by Rankin and Bass and Bakshi. And then of course later the Peter Jackson films, Lord of the Rings and uh, The Hobbit. And particularly the Lord of the Rings goblins like in Fellowship of the Rings, Mines of Moria area. I thought they looked really cool. The goblins in Legend I thought were fantastic. I liked the variety in them. And of course Labyrinth, Jim Henson's Labyrinth, which was my favorite movie when I was a kid. And all the different wondrous varieties of goblins in there, which were largely uh, conceptualized by the fantastic artist Brian Froud. Is Yoda a goblin? I don't know, kind of. Goblin is an interesting thing. It's a really, really old type of mythic representation. It goes all the way back to really as ancient as we have records. And there are a bunch of interrelated creatures. Kobalos, Kobold, Goblin, Boggle, Boogie, Boogeyman, Bugbear. Small, sneaky, mischievous, trickster things. And if you offend them, they are going to wreak havoc on you. And there are some that are a bit darker and nastier, and some that are a bit more gray and neutral, or maybe they could even help you a bit if you offer them something. Goblins basically represent all those little problems in life that just kind of pop up seemingly out of nowhere, and if you don't deal with them, they are just going to overwhelm you. Like that stack of bills and letters and unanswered emails that you've been ignoring and the pile just keeps growing and growing. Yeah, that's a horde of goblins. Or like a hundred or a thousand different bad micro habits that you have that you kind of let accumulate within you and within your life. Yeah, those eventually are going to overwhelm you. And I like to express that through the lore, that mischievous, trickster, nasty, robber, knave type personality for the goblins. They're spiteful, they are gluttonous, they're envious, they are lusty to a degree. They're kind of bad in every way. They're just very, very, very flawed people, essentially. They're little, extremely flawed 
people. And the world building piece to me is so important. So I think about a couple things. One, I think about where are they in the world? Like literally what kind of environment do they live in? What kind of landscape are they dwelling in? How do they interact with that terrain and the flora and fauna of that area? And then I like to have some different goblin tribes and some little details that make them distinct and how do they engage with each other and with other races and other creatures? What are they trying to do? Like their, their current goals and such. I also think a lot about the gods, the religious aspect of it. That might be one of the best places to start, actually. What does this creature worship? What is this creature's god or gods? Because the god is like this super form of some force or some personality or some characteristic. It's this spirit that embodies the essence of whatever the force is. And then that spirit infuses or imbues or motivates the creatures that worship it. So if you're ever stuck with working on the lore or the world building of a creature, go to its god or pantheon or its religion and see what is there at the depths and at the pinnacle. And that spirit is really going to motivate the creature and that can really spark things for you and, and, and get you some traction. So let's take a look at these goblins and the dungeon map. Let's start by looking at one of the main gods that these goblins worship. Not the only one, but the main one for this part of the world. I'll also show off some bits of the dungeon map Moss Folly Caverns to give us some visuals as I'm talking about him. Vormag, the Devourer, the Corpulent One, the Great Maw, the Nasher. He is a regional god worshipped mainly in Magnaland. Magnaland is the largest continent in the world of Ikoros. It's in a north central to northern part of the world. Vormag's divine domains are evil, feast, and spite. His primary alignment is neutral evil, and his secondary alignment is chaotic evil. No virtues are associated with Vormag. The main vices associated with him are gluttony, lust, and wrath. His creature type is giant. I believe that could change, but for now that's what I'm going with. And his symbol is a scowling face with a large open mouth. Vormag appears as a titanic man with a large mouth and a powerful, corpulent body. He is always shown with a scowl or expression of ire. Some depictions of Vormag include him wielding weapons, such as morning stars, great clubs, flails, or battle axes, while others portray him as a grappler whose maw can open to horrific extents. The details of his appearance vary depending upon which race is depicting him. His typical worshippers include ogres, trolls, hill giants, orcs, and goblinoids, though there are a few factions of dwarves and humans that follow the Devourer. Many hedonists serve Vormag, whether they know it or not. Vormag is a vindictive and hateful god. He is easily annoyed or slighted, and he never lets go of grudges. His appetites for food, drink, mayhem, and carnal delights are vast, and even after gorging himself, he is rarely satiated for more than but a moment. In many ways, he is a brutish god who acts out of impulse and immediate hedonism. Though he is not totally erratic, his inclination towards violence gives him an appreciation for those who develop skill in battle. Due to Vormag's many hungers and his spiky temperament, he is often involved in conflict. Many of these clashes can be seen as petty fights and spiteful quarrels, but from Vormag's perspective, they are all important matters. From time to time, he initiates more elaborate campaigns, which often involve his conquest of territories on plains beyond the material. This brings him into conflict with various other deities and other beings of power. Most worshippers of Vormag believe that he injects energy into the cosmos, and if it were not for him, religious ideas would have no contrast, no disagreement by which to be sharpened. That said, the worship of Vormag rarely ever emphasizes philosophy or complex doctrines. His followers are in it to feed their appetites and to unleash their aggression. Shrines of Vormag range from filthy caves to stonework temples, and the rituals that take place there are orgiastic frenzies of consumption and violence. 
The way that Vormag interacts with mortals varies quite a bit. He gives his followers a lot of emotional drives. They really feel the spite and the aggression and those different hungers and lusts. He has a moderate amount of verbal communication in which he actually speaks with people, but when it comes to anything in a written form, he doesn't inspire very much. There is not a large amount of religious text associated with Vormag. He provides a moderate amount of visible phenomena, visual signs that people can see, and he does not impart many dreams or visions. He's not much in that cerebral, visionary, dream quest type state. So as we're continuing to see some images of this Moss Folly Caverns dungeon map, let's then transition to looking at three goblin tribes that are associated with this area of the world, this part of Magnaland. There's the Kirche, the Bog Spike, and the Rumstalag. The Kirche's home is Kirche Fortress, which is well east of Moss Folly Caverns in a cleared section of the Gnarlwood Forest. Their religion is the worship of Vormag, specifically northern goblinoid Vormagian. The Kirche goblin's appearance is red-skinned and thick of hair. Their temperament and alignment is high-strung, greedy, gluttonous, lustful, spiteful things that are typically neutral evil in alignment. Their specializations include the training of giant turtles and the working of wood, stone, and metal. The goals of the Kirche include plundering as much wealth and resources from the region as possible, to increase the Kirche population, and to expand Kirche territory, preferably in a northwestern direction closer to human settlements. The current population of Kirche is approximately 500 goblins. Now we turn to the Bog Spike tribe. The name of their tribe is also the name of their home. They call their home Bog Spike as well. It's south of Moss Folly Caverns. It's a small swamp with goblin hovels clustered around a huge tree stump that ends in a point, though a portion of their combatants do remain presently at Moss Folly. Their religion is essentially the same as the Kirche's, the worship of the god Vormag, in a goblinoid persuasion to be particular. The Bog Spike's appearance is more of a tan or sallow skinned, and they are thin of hair. Temperament-wise, they're known to be slothful, deceitful, envious, gluttonous, lustful, spiteful things of a neutral evil alignment, typically. Specializations include the training of giant frogs and fast reproduction, which is saying a lot because even goblins, typically speaking, are known to breed like rats. The goals of the Bog Spikes include defeating a gang of brindle caps that have been vexing them, and to gain the favor of the goddess Almalika, the brood mother. The Bog Spikes have the largest population in the region at currently 800 goblins. And the third goblin tribe in this region is the Rumstalag, and their home is Moss Folly Caverns down in the lower reaches. Their religion is different. They are not known to worship Vormag, the Devourer, but rather they worship some elder demons, such as Peshpiak, an elder demon of underground lakes who resembles a blind serpent worm, Shestaglav, an elder demon bat with six heads, and Unadrevan, an elder demon who resembles a giant horseshoe crab, a lurker who persists for great spans of time. The appearance of the Rumstalag is pretty striking. They are pale-skinned and with sunken eyes. Their hair is just wispy, but they typically shave it off. In terms of temperament, they are vicious, cold-hearted, greedy, spiteful, and very strict. They are typically lawful evil. In terms of specializations, they train giant bats, they make traps, and they are adept at magic. The goals of the Rumstalag are to reclaim the upper levels of Moss Folly Caverns, and drive out the subjects of the dragon Bittersteel, which are some of those bog spike goblins that are currently dwelling there. The populations of the Rumstalags presently are a bit lower than the others, with 400. So, Moss Folly Caverns and the associated goblin tribes here. So we're looking at the Gnarlwood region of northwestern Magdaland. There's this cave network called Moss Folly Caverns. It's named for its upper chambers, which have a lot of mosses and ferns and other flora growing there, as well as some big bogs, like swamp bogs in the cave. This location has quite a bit of history, both distant history and more recent incidents. The caverns were originally controlled by a green dragon named Verstaparpalek. She was old, mighty, and thoroughly corrupt. 
Throughout her multiple centuries of life, she had amassed a hoard of wealth from all those she had slain or manipulated. After several generations of people had suffered from this scourge, a brotherhood of heroes known as Altamarus delved into her lair and managed to slay her. This awful battle left them weakened, and the lair guardians overwhelmed them in the aftermath. A tribe of goblins were prominent among these minions of Verstaparpalek. They were a particularly nasty lot of cave dwellers known as the Rumstalags, and after the demise of their draconic mistress, their chieftain declared himself king of Mosfali and the rightful inheritor of her treasure hoard. One glaring problem with this declaration was the fact that the hoard was extremely well hidden, and the secret to accessing this hoard seemed to have died along with Verstaparpalek herself. Now coming into the present, just a few years ago, two rival goblin tribes of the region joined forces, the Kirche and the Bog Spikes. This tenuous alliance descended upon Mosfali, where they clashed with the Rumstalags in hopes of locating and claiming the lost horde of Verstaparpalek. The fighting was fraught with complications and blunders on all sides, and this led to numberless stalemates. In the midst of this prolonged siege, a group known as Domus Draconis arrived at Mosfali. They were a party of spellcasters joined by a five-eyed dragon named Bittersteel, and they operated under the auspices of Vanjagash, the only major city in this Narwood region. Domus Draconis made two excursions into Mosfali Caverns, the first of which was rather disastrous, and the second of which was successful. They defeated the warring goblin factions and located the hidden treasure hoard. In the wake of this incident, the Rumstalags were driven farther underground, and the surviving members of this Kirche Bog Spike alliance, which really aren't many and really just are composed by Bog Spikes, they remained in these upper caves, having sworn fealty to the dragon Bittersteel, inasmuch as a goblin's vow is worth anything. In the current day, Bittersteel is actually far from this region. He is leading a conquest in the southern continent of Jaya, though he communicates via sending with his goblin subjects from time to time. So in issue number 79 of Scrolls the Bard, this newsletter of mine from just this March 2024, there are a few goblins in the free version and a few more in the patron version. So definitely go check those out. The links are down in the video description. In the free version, there is the goblin beast rider, which would represent those that ride on the giant turtles or giant frogs or giant bats. It's slightly stronger than a baseline goblin that you would find just like the grunt goblin from the monster manual. It has a beast rider trait that helps it and the mount that it's riding resist getting knocked around or knocked prone. It wields a short bow or a morning star, and it also has an action called blade and fang where it can make a weapon attack, and then the trained mount that it's riding can spend its reaction to move up to 10 feet and make an attack of its own. There is also the Goblin Cutthroat, which is a third level Goblin Rogue. It's going to have a bit of sneak attack and some roguish skills and the Rogue's cunning action. The free version of the newsletter also includes a Goblin Pyromancer, which is a third level Goblin Wizard who has a lot of fire type spells, and a Goblin Ratmaster, which is a Goblin who can summon a swarm of rats or call them in by making this high-pitched squeak, and he also has a feature called Gnaw Him to Bones. The goblin makes a weapon attack against a creature and then commands an allied rat or rat swarm to go in and make an attack as well. Oh, I also included the stat block of the Ridgeback Turtle from Esper's Emporium of Esoterica, and this serves as a mount for the Beast Rider of the Kirche tribe. There are also a few goblin combat encounters that I statted out here for these guys. The patron version of the newsletter, which is for everyone at the lore keeper level or higher, has four more goblin stat blocks in here. There's the goblin Eldritch Blade, which is sort of a gish type goblin. It can do attacks with scimitars and cast spells simultaneously. It also has a ray of dissolution, magical action, where it shoots out these three beams of acid damage, essentially, and that can impose lingering acid on the targets. And there's the Goblin Priest of Vormag, which is that main goblin god. It's essentially a third level cleric goblin. There is a Goblin Tribe Chief, which would be the leader, representing the leader of one of these tribes. It is a legendary monster, but since it's just a challenge rating 4, it just gets one legendary resistance per day. 
and one legendary action per round, and it can provoke other goblins to go attack or do this spiteful strike where it makes a weapon attack, but if it misses, it gets advantage on its next attack roll against that same target. And to round things off, I put in a goblin were rat, which is very much inspired by the were rat lycanthrope from my upcoming 5e book, Monstrous Heroes. I took some of the were rat lycanthrope features that I thought were cool, added them to a base of a goblin, came up with the CR2 goblin were rat, which I think is very fitting as rats are one of the most typical beasts associated with goblins. So here's what you can do. Go check out the link in the video description. It takes you to my Patreon and you can get the free version of this newsletter and the Moss Valley Caverns dungeon map or you can join as a patron and get the full version, which will have the additional stat blocks and the map of Moss Folly is much bigger, much, much bigger, includes probably three times as many areas on it. All right, well, that should do it for now. Thanks, everybody. I hope this gave you some good ideas and some creative sparks. A bardic bow of gratitude to my patrons, especially those who are in the council. Until we meet again, my brave companions, may your adventures be many. Many.